Hello, my name is Steve Bauer. Welcome to the workshop, Sexual Concerns in Men After Transplantation. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Mahal. Dr. John Mahal is the Director of the Male Sexual and Reproductive Medicine Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. He also serves on the Board of Directors of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America and is a past president. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Sexual Medicine and has published extensively on sexual health and fertility preservation after cancer therapy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mahal. Thank you, Steve. Um, thanks to BMT um, Infonet for having me do this. Thank you for joining me uh, in the middle of your day. Um, I'm a urologist who specializes in sexual and reproductive medicine. I've been doing this for 26 years. I've been at Memorial Sloan Kettering for 19 years. So pretty much 100% of the patients I see have sexual complaints or fertility problems. And of course, being at a cancer center, I have uh, very experienced in seeing patients after transplantation of um, various types. Uh, these are my disclosures, as I'm wont to uh, show you. Uh, I have no uh, conflicts, I have no industry conflicts in this space, uh, especially in the testosterone space where there are a potential for a lot of conflicts. So male sexual dysfunction covers a broad array of problems from erectile problems, low sex drive, failure to ejaculate, premature ejaculation, low testosterone, orgasmic problems, including failure to achieve orgasm, painful orgasm, uh, sexual incontinence, which is not a, a problem so much after uh, transplant, but certainly a problem in patients who have radical pelvic surgery, so uh, radical prostatectomy or radical cystectomy patients. And then penile length alterations and penile deformity. To start um, talking a little bit about low sex drive, our focus today is going to be on low testosterone and erectile dysfunction. Um, so we will just do a little bit of a, a preamble with that low sex drive on a couple of other problems. There aren't that many causes of low sex drive. Technically, there are three causes. There are endocrine or hormonal problems, which include low testosterone, high prolactin, a, a hormone from the brain, uh, hypoprolactinemia is associated with low sex drive, and then underactive thyroid. The use of antidepressant medications is complicated by the fact that people use antidepressant medications when they're depressed. And if you're depressed, um, very likely you're going to have low sex drive. But there are classes of antidepressants that are associated with low sex drive, and they are classically SSRIs or SNRIs. Um, there are a couple of very penis-friendly or sex-friendly uh, antidepressants, including buspiron and um, Wellbutrin. Psychological causes throughout the country are probably the most common cause of low sex drive. And anything under that umbrella term that um, is a dis is distressing event or occurrence in someone's life can distract you from sex and is a cause of low sex drive. Delayed orgasm or at its very terminal stage, an orgasm is a complete failure to achieve an orgasm, really only has four major causes, the use of SSRI medications. And remember, these medications, particularly the first generation of these medications, like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, and, uh, those classic drugs which are used for premature ejaculation treatment, are so effective at delaying orgasm that they may, in fact, in some men, cause a delay in orgasm. Low testosterone, again, uh, not even very low testosterone. Testosterone in the low normal range has been associated with uh, difficulty with achieving an orgasm. Penile sensation loss, as you can imagine, if for some reason you have sensation loss in your penis, your penis is no longer sensitive, then it may be more difficult for you to achieve an orgasm. Uh, throughout the world, the most common cause of that would be diabetes. Of course, diabetics are at risk for neuropathy. But at a cancer center, a very common cause of this is the use of chemotherapy that causes neuropathy, and we see this all the time in my practice. And just as with low sex drive, again, a very common cause of delayed orgasm is psychological causes. And again, there's lots of different reasons under there, whether it's interpersonal conflict or life stressors, 
first relationship after being widowed, first relationship after being divorced, uh, high kind of uh, conflict uh, relationships. From a fertility standpoint, any chemotherapy technically puts a man at risk for at least temporary fertility problems. It takes about 74 days for a sperm to be formed. And when you're exposed to chemotherapy, there is DNA damage to the sperm. And you should not um, attempt to get anyone pregnant um, for the first 12 months at least after the completion of chemotherapy or testicular or pelvic radiation. We always recommend people undergoing uh, chemotherapy who are interested in having a family to bank sperm before the commencement of chemotherapy. If you've had chemotherapy and you're wondering about your future fertility status, I would wait at least one if not two years after completion of your chemo and typically somewhere between two and five years after transplant, the uh, optimum recovery of sperm to the semen will occur. You may have perfectly normal semen, but there may be no sperm inside it. So you may look at your semen and it may look the exact same as it always has all your life, but there might be no sperm in there. Only 5% of semen is actually sperm. So you wouldn't be able to tell from just looking at the semen whether there's a problem or not. That would require a semen analysis. So how does cancer cause sexual problems? Well, uh, on the far left-hand side, surgery, of course, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, rectal cancer, um, those operations which are not really relevant to you today, but they interfere with the nerve supply and blood supply to the penis. Uh, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, radiation, they can have a negative impact upon erectile tissue. And I'll talk about erectile tissue in a little bit, but um, suffice it to say that your penis is very much like your biceps, right? So it's a muscle. If you put your hand around your penis, most of what's inside your hand is a muscle, and that muscle needs to be exercised. And radiation can cause damage to that muscle, and no testosterone can cause damage to the muscle, especially if the testosterone levels are very low. Now, again, you've heard me say this several times already today, psychological causes or factors is an umbrella term, and there are many different things that are under there. In fact, even just the distress of being diagnosed with cancer can cause sexual problems. This is very common for us to see men who've literally had no treatment for their cancer, but they've literally just been diagnosed, and that alone can tip them over into a state of sexual dysfunction. The next three slides is looking at some of the literature uh, in the transplant population. The literature is not fantastic, I have to tell you, but I'll talk you through this. This is from um, a, a Swedish group, uh, one of the Swedish registries, uh, probably the best registries in the world or in Scandinavia. They keep track of everyone from the time they're born to the time that they die. This is over 2,500 men and women survivors of childhood cancer. Um, sexual function was compared to the general population sample. Sexual dysfunction was reported by 57% of women and 35% of male survivors. So it's a very prevalent, very common problem. Among the men, the most common dysfunctions were satisfaction with sex life. So men complaining about a significant reduction in their sex life satisfaction, reduction in sexual interest, and then, of course, erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction, just so you know, the definition is the consistent inability uh, to obtain and or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual relations. Compared with the general population, the cancer survivors, the male survivors had an increased likelihood of difficulty achieving an orgasm, a two-fold risk, and erectile problems, a two-fold risk also. More intensive cancer treatment regimens, emotional distress, and body image disturbance were associated with sexual dysfunction in survivors, men and women. Uh, this is an observational single center study. There's only 105 subjects, so this will be classified as a very small study. Testicular function and sexuality were evaluated through hormone testing and, and the sex questionnaire. A higher occurrence of low testosterone was seen in men, one in five. Impaired sperm production. This is very common in men who get yeah, chemotherapy, especially uh, temporary sperm production problems. And erectile dysfunction in this study occurred in the majority of men um, within the population. Chronic graft versus host disease was associated with increased risk of developing ED. Of course, these patients are sick, and any sickness is going to put you sex life towards the bottom of the list of things that are important in, in one's life. Um, this is uh, called a systematic review. So basically, they took a number of studies and they looked at them together as a unit. 14 studies were included. Um, what they show is they present a heterogeneity 
in how sexual function is measured. So from one study to the next, how one author or investigator defines sexual dysfunction might be different from another investigator. The common theme that emerged from most of these studies is that sexual dysfunction negatively impacts upon quality of life. And this is very, very common throughout any medical condition, not just cancer, not just transplant, but any medical condition that causes uh, sexual dysfunction impairs quality of life. The most common sexual problems reported were erectile dysfunction for men and lack of desire in women. And in the majority of studies, improvement in physical and psychological symptoms and sexual function led to improvement in quality of life over time. Let's talk about erectile dysfunction. This is an important slide. This asks men and women, over the course of the last 12 months, when you come out of seeing your family doctor, how often were you asked about any sexual difficulties you had? The far right-hand side is North America, USA and Canada. And you can see that really throughout the world, with rare exceptions, it's uncommon that people get asked in regular family practice about their sex life. In fact, when I used to speak on female sexual dysfunction, I used to ask the women in the audience, put your hand up if your gynecologist has asked about your sex life in the last 12 months. And very rarely, uh, one, one hand, uh, someone's hands go up. So, and, and, and the reasons for this are, are really um, there are a multitude of reasons, but uh, most physicians don't get trained in, in sexual medicine. The average medical student gets two hours of education in sexual medicine during medical school. One of the barriers to discussing ED for the patient, of course, there is embarrassment, shame, ignorance about normal function, cultural and religious beliefs that precludes a patient talking to a doctor, and just general discomfort. Physician, likewise, discomfort on physicians. Um, when patients are surveyed about why they didn't bring up their sex life to the doctor, two-thirds of those patients will say, because I got the impression the doctor would be embarrassed if I discussed this. Physician lack of knowledge. I've already talked about the very little education that physicians get. Uh, personal bias uh, and time in modern clinical practice. Uh, there's a lot to get through when talking to patients. And uh, one sex life is low on the totem pole for most physicians. It would be important for you, if your sex life was important, for you to bring this up to your doctor. So um, whether that doctor is comfortable speaking to you about it or not, they should know or should have resources uh, for you to follow up on if they're not the person to speak to. Um, I put this up very simply to um, uh, support the concept that the brain is incredibly important for sexual function. First of all, orgasm occurs in the brain. But even for erectile function, there are centers in the brain that are essentially the spark plugs for starting the erectile machinery to function. So anything that impacts upon the brain, whether it's stress, whether it's a tumor, whether it's a stroke, can interfere with sexual function. This is a diagrammatic representation of down here, the flaccid state in the penis, and then the erect state. And I want you to think of this Swiss cheese structure of the erectile tissue, right? And these spaces, they're called lacunae, these lacunae are contracted under adrenaline during the day. We walk around with the high levels of adrenaline in our penis. That's what keeps the muscle contracted and our penis is flaccid. When we are aroused, chemicals, particularly nitric oxide, is uh, secreted into the penis and it causes this muscle to undergo relaxation. And these tiny little Swiss cheese spaces become broad and large and they fill up with blood. And that is essentially what erection is. I want you to think of your penis like a bicycle tire. There are two arteries. You can see the artery. This is the cavernosal artery in the middle of the erection chamber. And that brings in blood. And that blood fills up the erection chamber. But the blood has to be trapped inside the penis. So there is a valve mechanism. And the health of the muscle in the penis controls the valve. So blood flows in, oxygenated, red blood, and it gets trapped in there until we have an orgasm. And then the muscle contracts again and blood leaves the penis. And that's essentially all an erection is. It's a hydraulic event that is best thought of just like a bicycle tire. If you were to look at the general population, who are a man who had physically based ED, right? And that's generally estimated to be 80 to 85% of all men. 80 to 85% of men, of all men have 
physically-based ED. That's not to say that they don't have a secondary psychological component. As a man, we're only as good as our last direction. If our last direction is not good, then the next direction is going to be a problem. We have anticipatory anxiety. But if you just look at men, these are the major causes. If you've had a transplant and you've had a erection problem, you might actually have another cause besides your transplant of having erection problems such as vascular diseases, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, cigarette smoking, diabetes, as you can see, is a very strong cause. Certain medications are associated with erection problems, pelvic surgery, neurological and hormonal problems. Right? So if you look at the very top of that pie graph, you'll see that 70% of men have either vascular causes or diabetes. And that they are by far and away the most common causes of erection problems in the world. If you look at conditions that cause, even in a transplant patient, I know you've had chemo, I know you haven't been feeling well, but a man who comes in who's had a transplant who has erection problems might actually have underlying diabetes or maybe his vascular diseases have caused a problem, as you can see listed here. These are the fold likelihood of men having erection problems. And as you can see, diabetics have like terrible risk of developing erection problems. This is a process of care model. It's a very useful model to think about how would we, as physicians, treat men with erection problems. The first would be lifestyle modification, stopping cigarette smoking, looking after sugar, looking after blood pressure, looking after cholesterol, looking after stress level. Medication adjustments, if a man went on a medication and had um, a temporally related uh, erection problems, then maybe we'd try to change that medication. If there's obvious interpersonal conflict, try to have that addressed at the same time. And from a treatment standpoint, then oral agents, the Viagra drugs known as PDE5 inhibitors, are, of course, the first-line treatment as our vacuum devices. Second-line treatment, penis injections. That's called intracavernosal injections. And then the urethral suppository um, called MUSE, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Third-line therapy is penile implants and vascular surgery. These are typically reserved for very special populations, especially men who've tried the first and second-line therapies and either failed or found them unpalatable. So this is the Viagra group. Remember, Viagra was introduced in March of 1998. It was tried for many years before then as a medication for angina. It wasn't a very good anti-angina agent, but the men in the trials were not giving their Viagra back because they were all getting erections again. Right? And that's how, that's how the story started. You should not be using nitroglycerin. The interaction between Viagra drugs and nitroglycerin is potentially lethal. Massive drop in blood pressure. You should be able to walk up and down two flights of stairs without chest pain. If you can't do that, you do not have enough exercise reserve to participate in sexual relations. It's not even for Viagra. It's just for resumption of sex. You have to have some kind of exercise reserve. We start all of our patients at maximum dose pills, whether it's Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, or Sandra. We reduce the dose then for um, a good response or for side effects. If you take maximum dose and you get a phenomenal erection, uh, then we'll probably drop you to half maximum dose to see how you do, to be cost efficient. Uh, if you look at the patient instructions, this is very, most physicians will never give patients instructions about how to use the pill. But if you're using Viagra, Levitra, or Sandra, it's pretty straightforward. You take two hours before a meal, you have an eight hour window of opportunity, and sexual stimulation is required, penis and brain. You can't go sit in the corner and read the New York Times and get an erection. You need to be sexually aroused for these pills to work. For Cialis, Cialis kicks in usually within two, definitely four hours. But Cialis is unique in the sense that it lasts one dose, maximum dose lasts for at least 24 hours. So for couples who have frequent or unpredictable relations, there are the patients in my practice who use Cialis where most of the people are going to be happy with Viagra. Uh, we always follow up with our patients because patients drop out. The estimates are that one-third of men will drop out from using Viagra pills after one prescription and 50% by six months. That even though the pills are giving men erections, they're not treating all of the problems that they're having sexually in the bedroom. Side effects are classic. 15% of men get headache, 10% get facial flushing, 7% get GI side effects, predominantly heartburn, 
4% get nasal congestion and 2% get visual disturbance, which is blurred vision, double vision, and this loss of color vision, what's called the blue haze, because these drugs are PDE5 inhibitors, but they cross-react with PDE6, which is the retinal enzyme, the enzyme in the eye. Long-acting PD5 inhibitors like Cialis are sometimes associated with muscle aches, which for most men are not particularly bothersome, but for occasional men, they are very bothersome. And then there is an increased incidence of tinnitus in men who use these pills also, most of which is reversible. So the high-risk groups are those men who have inadequate exercise reserves. They cannot exercise. They don't have enough exercise reserve to participate in sexual relations. And that's why we ask the question, Mr. Jones, can you walk up and down two flights of stairs briskly without chest pain? Retinal diseases such as retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, we would always ask the ophthalmologist to give us approval to use these drugs. Certain HIV medications cause such a massive increase in the dose of Viagra drugs in the blood that they are associated with problems. And then pulmonary hypertension medication may be a problem. This is a diagrammatic representation of a vacuum device, a cylinder that's placed over the penis. Usually we encourage men to trim the hair off the base of the penis. We encourage them to put KY jelly around the base of the penis to act as a seal. And then um, either using the, you can see on the left-hand side, the manual pump or battery operated, the penis becomes um, erect inside the chamber. And then these little rings that you see here, these little black rings are placed around the cylinder and they're slid down over the base of the penis to act as an artificial valve. Now, the compliance with this, the use for the long term, is fairly low. And it's fairly low because the penis doesn't look normal, nor does it feel normal. The penis is usually not completely rigid. And for most men, the kind of tightness to the ring that's required to act as the artificial valve it may be quite uncomfortable. But it is a strategy, and uh, it has very, very few side effects. Um, and it's very easy to use. If you're on an anticoagulant, okay, if you're on warfarin or you're on um, some other anticoagulants like Pradaxa or something like that, or Eliquis, then we would encourage you not to use the vacuum device because of the concerns of getting a penile hematoma. This is the urethral suppository, MUSE, medicated urethral suppository for erection, introduced in 1997, about the size of a Uncle Ben's grain of rice, and it's put into the urethra, and it gets absorbed into, through the urethra into the erection chamber. It works in about 50% of men. The problem is it works in those men about 50% of the time. You have to stand. You have to apply the, um, the suppository after urinating. The urine lubricates and speeds up the dissolution, the dissolving of the uh, suppository. And you have to massage the penis for 10 to 20 minutes or so. Um, so it's not the most spontaneous treatment, but there are some people, for example, who don't respond to Viagra and don't want to try penis injections, and this is an option. This tends to be expensive if it's not covered uh, by insurance. As with all medications for erections, the only real risk is the risk of priapism. You see those ads on TV, four hours, call your doctor. The chances of priapism occurring with a pill in my practice, so I've been using PD5 inhibitors now for 24 years, never, never, not once, have I had a case of priapism with a pill. The MUSE is associated with priapism, particularly at the maximum dose, um, although it's very uncommon. And this is a gold standard medication, as unappetizing as it may appear here. If you have tried a pill and it's not working, this is an excellent strategy for you, okay? By the way, it's important to know that 15, 1-5% of men who have psychologically based erection problems, whose erection machinery is perfectly normal, 15% do not respond to pills. And so injection therapy might be used temporarily in, in those men. But injection therapy is very easy. A man injects his penis five to 10 minutes before uh, sexual intercourse. 90% uh, plus, 90% plus of men will get an erection good enough for intercourse. The average man gets an erection in five to 10 minutes and it's lasting 30 to 40 minutes. It's a two visit training session to teach you how to inject yourself and then how to figure out a, a good starting dose because priapism, prolonged erections, erection lasting longer than four hours is a real entity 
with injection therapy. But in our program, for example, with good training and monitoring, the chances of priapism happening is about 0.2%. Um, contraindications, the antidepressant medications that are known as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOI, they are not very frequently used in depression, but they're making a comeback, actually, in that field. So that's something that we're always inquiring about. If you can't see your penis, if you have manual dexterity problems, if you're visually impaired, uh, there are problems for putting a needle in, in any part of your body, but especially the penis, because we want you injecting in a particular place at a particular angle and a particular depth of the needle. People who are on blood thinners and people who have penile curvature, they're not absolute contraindications, but they are precautions, and they make us uh, think more carefully about whether that patient is a good candidate for injection therapy or not. Yeah, the advantages of penis injections are they're highly effective. I've already told you probably 90 plus percent of men will get a good erection. It mimics the natural physiology of erection. The penis looks normal, it feels normal. There's no effect on penile sensation, ejaculation, or fertility. It's got a high level of discretion and some level of spontaneity. Obviously, you have to take a break and say, I need to inject my penis. It's not a great strategy for men who are starting a new relationship and they're out on dates with partners, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always a good idea to perhaps explore the concept of disclosure if you're going to use injections in a new relationship. On a disadvantage standpoint, they, uh, standpoint, they have poor long-term tolerability. So the dropout rate is probably 50 to 60% over the first five years. Now, people get tired of injecting, um, et cetera, or they're needle phobic. It does require training and does require follow-up. And there are insurance issues where the medication itself is not covered. Saying that, when we use the medication we use is called Trimix, T-R-I-M-I-X. It's a mixture of three generic drugs that's been around since 1985. And they're all generic, and it's dirt cheap. The bottle is about $75, and that bottle should last most men three to six months. What about over-the-counter supplements? Okay, you see ads on TV all the time about over-the-counter supplements. Now, I think you're all aware, I think the American consumer is much more savvy now than a decade ago. You're all aware that these products that you see advertised on TV or you go to GNC or vitamin shop, there's no regulatory agency approval. So they're not actually approved by the FDA for these indications. There's a 30% placebo response rate in ED drug trials. So 30% of men, you give them an aspirin, they're going to say they're better. Um, after uh, taking uh, an aspirin, for example. Some of these over-the-counter supplements contain testosterone. Some actually contain uh, traces of drugs like Viagra or Cialis. And, of course, it's not a victimless crime. By that, I mean that if you are a patient who must not use Viagra medications because, let's say, you're using nitroglycerin or certain pulmonary hypertension medications, and you go to GNC and you buy some of these products and they are laced with Viagra, Theoretically, you're putting your life at risk. So let's switch over and talk about uh, low testosterone. There are many causes of low testosterone. The ones that are most germane to you are going to be exposure to chemotherapy or testicular radiation. Okay? But there are many causes, including HIV, AIDS, chronic narcotic use, uh, chronic steroid use, etc. The signs and symptoms are pretty straightforward. The problem with the signs and symptoms of low testosterone is that they're also the signs and symptoms of chronic stress, chronic fatigue, or poor sleep. For a patient, for example, who has sleep apnea. Low sex drive, low energy, afternoon fatigue, depression, irritability, loss of muscle, decreased endurance, weight gain, bone density loss, decreased productivity at work. These are the classic symptoms of low testosterone. And probably the most important thing in a testosterone is getting a blood test to check the testosterone level. The problem is, I don't know what your testosterone level was. If you walk in at 55 years of age, I don't know what your testosterone level was when you were 20, which is really the most important number. Where did that man start off in the prime of his um, testosterone manhood? Chemotherapy causes low testosterone. And that's why many patients during chemotherapy and some in the long term are left with many of these symptoms. If you're going to get a testosterone level check, it should be in the early morning. While there is a circadian rhythm where it's highs in the morning and lows in the afternoon, and while that circadian rhythm is blunted in older men, we always check testosterone levels in an early morning fashion to have a look at what is the most accurate testosterone level. 
What are the risks of low testosterone? There is accumulating evidence that major adverse cardiac events, heart attacks and strokes, cardiovascular events are associated with low testosterone levels, particularly testosterone levels that are very low. So low is below 300, below 200. That's when you start getting into the risk of cardiac events. That's when you get into the risk of developing diabetes. That's when you get into the risk of developing osteoporosis. Our phrase in our practice is bone, sugar, heart. Low testosterone, we don't give it to you because we want you to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger did as a young man. We give it to you to prevent cardiovascular events, to prevent bone density loss, and to prevent diabetes. There are no benefits of having a low testosterone. There is no evidence to show that your testosterone level in any way predicts the chances of you getting prostate cancer. In fact, the accumulating evidence now is that low testosterone is associated with higher stage, higher grade prostate cancer, not the other way around. The risks of testosterone therapy, if I give you testosterone therapy in any of its formats, um, well, there is usually, particularly if you're using intramuscular testosterone, an increase in the hemoglobin, especially in patients who have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea raises hemoglobin, and when sleep apnea patients go on testosterone, their hemoglobin can go dangerously high. Breast enlargement called gynecomastia is very rare. And then I've already alluded to the concept of uh, prostate cancer. There is absolutely, I'm a urologist. This is what I do for a living. I'm the chairperson of the American Urological Association of the Testosterone Guidelines Committee. And I will tell you definitively, there is no zero zilch evidence to suggest that prostate cancer risk is increased by me giving you testosterone therapy. The benefits improve physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, reduce heart attack risk perhaps, improve surgery control, and reduction in the risk of having osteoporosis. If your testosterone level gets very low, below 200, besides bone, sugar, heart, there is very good evidence in the Veterans Administration studies that there's an increased risk of death among those men. Low testosterone, I'm supposed to tell you, is a risk factor for heart attacks and strokes. That's the guidelines from the American Urological Association. We don't know just yet whether testosterone therapy is good or bad. There's just not enough evidence yet. But most of the literature in that regard shows that at least testosterone therapy is neutral to heart attacks. And increasingly, the more modern literature is showing that testosterone therapy is protective against heart attacks. Uh, this is that data. If you just look at large observational studies evaluating T therapy and risk of major adverse cardiovascular events has reported conflicting data. But if you look at the very bottom, the neutral effect on MACE and then the decrease in adverse events, cardiac adverse events, the uh, numbers of papers is, is accumulating. There are gel, creams, patches, pills, nasal sprays, shots, subcutaneous injections, subcutaneous pellets. There is a host an absolute host of uh, therapies that are out there uh, that can be used. And uh, much of it depends on what's covered by your insurance company and what your preference is. I will tell you that if you come in contact with young children on a regular basis, under 12 years of age, before puberty, on a regular basis, we will discourage you from using gels because the gels can be transferred from your skin or your hands onto your grandchildren, for example, or your children. Testosterone deficiency patients interested in fertility should have a reproductive health evaluation before testosterone therapy and should avoid testosterone therapy. Testosterone therapy, TTH, turns off our fertility hormones as men. And so you can go from having normal sperm concentration, going on testosterone, and having no sperm. That's not semen. Perfectly normal semen body, but no sperm inside your semen. So testosterone, in many regards, is a kind of a, let's say, a mediocre contraceptive. If you had low testosterone and fertility was important to you, there are three classes of drugs that we can use, clomiphene, uh, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, and aromatase inhibitors. This is our checklist. What does the patient want? The preferences for shots or the preferences for gels? What's the cost? We always check a hemoglobin, the adequate level of baseline, what's the PSA level, the prostate cancer blood test, what's the risk of transference, what's the interest in fertility, and some other factors. 
that are important in us deciding in a shared decision fashion with the patient which option, pills, gels, patches, shots, are best for him. So, take-home messages. Transplantations are, uh, patients are at high risk for sexual dysfunction for a variety of reasons. Dysfunctions and quality of life may improve over time. There's very little research in this specific population. Erectile dysfunction and low testosterone are by far and away the common sexual problems for men. Both conditions are eminently treatable. And see a clinician with expertise. Bring it up to your physician. If your physician says, this is not my area of expertise, see if he or she can refer you to a sexual medicine physician. They're nearly always urologists, and there are plenty of us around. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to take any questions for you. Thank you, Dr. Mulhall, for this excellent presentation. We will now take questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Our first question is, please address the matter of men's fertility. Has there been any success for fertility after pediatric transplant? I do not mean adoption. I mean genetic children. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it used to be thought that if you gave chemotherapy to a male before puberty, that the testicles were somewhat, some way quiescent and were protected from chemotherapy. That was uh, when I was in residency in the mid-90s, that was the standard philosophy. That is now known not to be true. Let me explain that to you. So chemotherapy damages the stem cells in the testicles. And if you eradicate enough stem cells, then you won't have uh, new stem cells developed and you won't be able to make sperm. Okay? So we now know that when young boys, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, get exposed to chemotherapy, that they too are at risk of long-term fertility problems. Now, this is dependent on many factors, but among the most important are what kind of chemotherapy agents. The worst ones will be alkylating agents like lofosamide, melphalan, drugs like that. But some regimens, for example, ABVD, is associated with very good sperm recovery. The sperm recovery after chemotherapy can take anywhere from one to five years. And that depends a little bit on the regimen that's used and uh, the dosing and how long that regimen, how many cycles, et cetera. So nowadays, what we do, even in prepubertal boys, is we'll do sperm extraction. So an eight-year-old is not going to be able to acquire any sperm in his ejaculate. doesn't have an ejaculate because he's prepubertal. And so we do sperm extraction from the testicle in those young boys, and we store that tissue. And we store that tissue in the hope that in the future, we will have technology that can take that tissue, those cells, and we can either um, transform those cells into real sperm or put those cells back into the testicle or some part of the body, and they will start maturing and growing sperm again. Okay? So this is a very, very hot area of research. It's been going on for decades. We know that we can do exactly as I've told you in other animals, rabbits and, and rats, and in some monkeys, we know that for sure, but we've not been able to grow immature sperm, immature sperm out to fully functional sperm uh, in humans as of yet. I am very confident that at some point in time in the future, we will. So if you are on the phone and you have a child who needs to have a, a transplant for some reason, it would be not unreasonable for you to speak to your cancer doctor and say, is there any chance we could just extract some testicle tissue, it takes 15, 20 minutes in the operating room, and store that for potential for future use? So that's an excellent question. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, are sexual function problems permanent? Are you ever able to get back to normal sexual activity like pre-transplant? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So what literature exists, as I said to you, it's not fantastic. The literature suggests that there is improvement over time in the first few years after transplant is completed. It all depends on what the cause of the erection problems are, right? So if there's a physical change in the machinery, okay, which is not the most common cause in transplant patients, but if there is, then you're probably not curable. You might be eminently treatable. The men who are curable 
are men who have predominantly psychologically based sexual problems. And if you have that, and that would require probably some testing or at least speaking to an expert to try to find what the cause was. If you had predominantly psychologically based sexual dysfunction, then technically you are curable. You might need to do treatment for a period of time for confidence restoration, but you are technically curable, absolutely. Thank you. The next question is, does exercise help your sex drive? So I think that exercise is good for stress, right? So we, have a, we can reduce our, our stress level uh, by exercising. And if you have a large contribution of stress towards your sexual dysfunction, one of which is low sex drive, then yes, absolutely, absolutely. Exercise can help blood vessels. So the lining of our blood vessels is called endothelium, and endothelium is activated by blood flow. And if you get your blood flowing quickly through your blood vessels, including through your penis, then the endothelium is healthier, and the endothelium may contribute to your erectile function, for example. But from a sex drive standpoint, if your sex drive is reduced because of high stress, then doing something meditative, exercise will be one of those things, yoga, meditation, for example, they all improve your sex drive for sure. Okay. I take Viagra and I'm able to achieve and maintain an erection but cannot achieve orgasm. Is this a common problem with transplant patients? So uh, it's a common, uh, common problem, uh, period. Um, if I could direct you back to the slide that I had for delayed orgasm, we talked about things like penile sensation loss. So if you had chemotherapy and you've got a neuropathy in your penis and sensation loss, it'll be difficult for you to get enough stimulation through to the brain centers that coordinate orgasm. If your testosterone level is low from chemotherapy, even temporarily, it may be difficult for you to achieve an orgasm. If you're on an SSRI or related meds, then maybe for pain, chronic pain, for example, any of those classes of medications can interfere with your orgasm. But if you look at the entire country, this is not just transplantation, but the entire country, probably one of the most common causes of delayed orgasm is psychologically based. Now, these men come in and they'll frequently say to me, I can never have an orgasm with my partner, or it takes me 45 minutes, doctor. And when we talk about when they're on their own with self-stimulation, oh, no, I routinely have an orgasm. You know, that takes me about five or 10 minutes. If that's the case, then those men have one of two problems. They either have a sensation problem in their penis, neuropathy, which they can overcome with vigorous self-stimulation, or it's a psychological phenomenon. That's a good question to think about if you're a doctor. Can the patient have an orgasm on their own without their partner? Yes, psychological or neuropathy in the penis. But if they have problems on their own or with their partner, then it might be something else like an SSRI medication like neuropathy, or like low testosterone. Thank you. Next question is, how about vitamins? Do they help? So the, the bottom line is that there's no evidence to show that vitamins help. But I have to tell you, the, the amount of study that's been put into vitamins that have been, studies have been done in a really correct way is almost zero, right? So it, it's hard to say there's no benefit, there's no literature to suggest that there's a benefit. Remember, I told you, there's a 30% placebo response rate. So in the Pfizer trials, when they were developing Viagra, 25 to 35% of patients using the placebo had improved erectile function. And that's a testament to the fact that um, every man with physically-based ED has at least some secondary psychological sexual dysfunction on top of their physical cause. So the bottom line is that we don't use vitamins, okay? That if you have a normal, healthy diet and your vitamin levels are normal, there's probably little benefit to your general health of taking vitamins, okay? And certainly not for your sexual health. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. As a 25-year-old who's anxious to have sex and a year post-transplant, who do you suggest I talk to about this? So I think the first thing to do will be to see a urologist who specializes in sexual medicine, okay? And if they felt you would benefit from speaking to a psychologist, 
then that's what I would do. Um, when I speak to patients, I can usually very quickly discern if the patient has pure physical or I would say predominantly physical versus predominantly psychological. So for example, men who've got psychological erection problems will frequently wake up in the middle of the night with excellent erections because the machinery is good. But when they're with their partner on their own, they don't do well at all. Or they might do well with one partner and not with another, right? That intermittency of function. So there are features in, in a man's history with erectile dysfunction that can guide somebody like me to determine whether it's physically based or psychologically based. And if I thought it was important, we could do an ultrasound and measure blood flow to define for sure if there was a physical problem or not. So I would start with the urologist first. There are many patients to all they really need is a little confidence restoration. They use Viagra for a period of months and they get their confidence level back and they don't have to even see a psychologist. If they can't get off the medication or if they prefer to see a psychologist, then we will refer them to a psychologist for sure. Thank you. Next question. I am 30 years old, day 150 after aloe transplant. Erections and orgasms are fine, but semen volume has been dropping since transplant and is now zero. Is semen expected to return in the future? So the first thing you need to do is get a testosterone level, right? So our semen is a testosterone-dependent uh, fluid. If you have low testosterone, you will not make, you will make less semen. And if your testosterone level is very low, you might not make any semen at all, okay? Now, there are other causes of no semen. There are classes of medications, for example, that cause the bladder neck, which usually contracts during orgasm, causes the bladder neck to relax, and they would be the classic prostate symptom drugs like um, uroxetrol and Flomax that cause relaxation of the bladder neck. But I think the first thing to do would be get a testosterone level checked and see what, if your T level is low or not. It's not uncommon for me to see men who've got low testosterone and the only symptom is, um, the, is their semen volume. All right. Next question. Thank you for answering the question about preserving fertility for extracting tissue for pre boys. However, if this was not done, is there anything at all that can be done? Do you recommend IBSI, the attempt to extract sperm, which may be hidden in the testes, but does not appear in the ejaculate? Or is this just an invasive procedure which has no success in this population? So um, we have huge experience in what's called testis sperm extraction, TESE, T-E-S-E, in the post-chemotherapy population. And if I'm to be honest with you, when men have no sperm in their semen, so you're going to do a semen, a semen specimen, like a semen analysis, the lab will take it and they will centrifuge it and they'll look to see at the bottom of the specimen, are there any sperm? If there's zero sperm in there, you have somewhere between a 30 and 40% chance of us finding sperm if we go into your testicle and do TESI. So it's not 100%, but it's not zero. And that will be the, the kind of the clinical care pathway, the flow that we would use. Do a good semen analysis. If there's no sperm, that's called azoospermia. If there's no sperm, then TESI, for sure, absolutely. And we would always wait till you're at least 12 months after that. And if you weren't in a huge rush, I would try and encourage you to wait two to three years because the evidence suggests that maximum recovery is at two to three years. All right. I have noticed less morning erection since transplant. Is it normal to, due to aging hormonal due to meds and long-term prednisone use? I'm 32. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for these questions. They're really very, very uh, insightful questions. So nocturnal erections are complicated. We get three to six erections every night as a male after puberty and they occur during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. The first problem is if you're not getting rapid eye movement sleep, then you can't get nocturnal erection, right? And there are many causes uh, of sleep disruption uh, in patients, whether they have cancer or not, whether they have transplant or not. So, you know, if you're not in REM sleep, you might just have no uh, nighttime erection, number one. Number two, if your testosterone level is low enough, our nocturnal erections are testosterone dependent. 
So if you have very poor testosterone levels, you may in fact not have nocturnal erection. So again, this is an excellent time for going to see a urologist who specializes in sexual medicine. Get a testosterone level check, get a good history, get a physical examination. And we should be able to tell with those tests whether you have um, good nocturnal erections or not, and you're just not waking up with them, whether you have low testosterone, whether you have a sleep problem, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for that. Next question is, I'm a 71-year-old male. I was administering a gel testosterone, but I think my breasts were enlarging. You mentioned this in your presentation, but can you elaborate? Yeah. So testosterone in the male body gets converted to estrogen. That's done to an enzyme called aromatase. Different men have different levels and different activity levels of aromatase in our system. It's usually in, uh, held in fat. So heavier men, men with more uh, fat tissue, are going to typically have more aromatase than skinnier men. Right? So depending on your aromatase levels and activity, you may take a lot of the testosterone that you were taking from the outside, the gel, right? And you may convert it to estrogen. If your estrogen level is high chronically, this doesn't happen over a few weeks, but if for months and months and months, you may end up getting breast tissue. That's called gynecomastia, okay? The problem is if you develop gynecomastia and you stop your testosterone and your testosterone level drops and your estrogen level drops, the gynecomastia may not reverse, right? So whenever we are putting men on testosterone, first of all, we always check an estrogen level before they go on any form of testosterone therapy, and we monitor that very carefully when men are on testosterone. The, two, the three things we, we measure very carefully when men are using testosterone is besides testosterone levels, which are critically important, we measure hemoglobin, so men don't get um, a high hemoglobin level. That's called polycythemia and they don't get a high estrogen level. And if they're above 40 years of age, then we would also measure a PSA, the prostate-specific antigen, the test for how to aid in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. So yes, high estrogen levels can be associated with testosterone treatment, especially if you have very high testosterone levels or you have high aromatase activity in your body. Thank you. My semen has been really watery since transplant. Is it because the lack of viable sperm or other cause? Yeah, good question. So only 5% of semen is sperm. So if you had no sperm in your semen, you will not see an iota of difference in the consistency or volume of semen. The average semen volume is one and a half to five cc's. Five cc's, by the way, is a teaspoon. That's the average volume of our, our uh, ejaculate, right? So it's impossible to tell by looking at your semen if there's sperm in there or not. When there's a consistency change, the first thing we think of is your testosterone level, right? So the first thing to do there will be to get a testosterone level check. And while we're on that, I told you before, get a testosterone blood test. Make sure you do it before 10 o'clock in the morning. It's not mandatory that you fast, some physicians like you to fast, it's not mandatory, but it's best done before 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? Um, so that would be a good reason. Consistency of semen changes would be a good reason to get some hormone testing done. Okay. I am a 76-year-old who has had prostate cancer removed at age 63. I had some function with Cialis until my transplant, which was nine months ago. Is there any hope for me? Um, so what I'm, I'm deducing from that is that the pills have stopped working in you. So, you know, um, if you're early after transplant, you might have temporary problems, right? And that might recover. Um, it sounds as if you are many years after your prostatectomy and uh, these pills, Cialis Viagra, were working um, so there is a chance they will work again, but again, remember in the transplant population, psychological factors and low testosterone. So this is a common theme you're hearing me talk about all the time. When a transplant patient comes in, we routinely measure testosterone levels in them because we frequently see transplant patients with sexual problems having low testosterone. 
and that might be the cause. When you have low, when you have very low testosterone levels, so remember I said 300, let's say 300 to 800 is considered normal. When your levels are very low, 200 and below, it is difficult for those patients to respond well to Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis, and Stendra, those PDE5 inhibitors. So that might be an indication that your T levels are low. All right. We're about out of time, so this next question will have to be our last question. I take Viagra, and I'm able to achieve and maintain an erection, but cannot achieve orgasm. Is this a common problem with transplant patients? Yeah, so that goes back to the whole concept of delayed orgasm, right? So the use of SSRI medications, penile sensation loss, low testosterone, and psychological causes, right? So go see somebody who specializes in sexual medicine. What we would do if you came to see us is we would measure your penile sensation, we would get a blood test, and we'll see if you're using an antidepressant medication. So in sexual medicine, psychological causes are diagnoses of exclusion. We have to make sure that the physical causes of that problem are ruled out, okay? So um, we'll get a blood test, do a penile sensation test, look at your meds, and if they were all normal, then I would look at you and I would say, Mr. Jones, this is a psychologically mediated phenomenon. Thank you very much. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Mohal, for your very helpful remarks, and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please let BMT InfoNet know if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of the symposium.